a little quick summary video of, upon request, the role and powers of the Prime Minister, Cabinet and the Ministry. So, um, I thought it might make the most sense to sort of go up a slow staircase from the least powerful minister to the most powerful minister, building as we go the additional roles that you, um, and additional powers you get as you move up the, this particular ladder. Um, so, let us start with assistant ministers, probably along with non-cabinet ministers, the least powerful members of this government. So assistant ministers, as the name implies, they assist ministers. Um, which ministers? The ones with the hardest jobs, the ones with the most significant workload. So they decided we need to have an additional um, minister to um, help that minister. It's also a good sort of learning experience for that minister, normally a sort of younger or less experienced member of parliament to help learn the ropes and um, perhaps seek a, a promotion into the future. But anyway, let's get to their roles and powers. So you need to know their role and powers. Um, so, of course, as the name implies, their primary role is to assist the administration of that government department that that minister is in charge of. Okay, you're not the actual minister, but you're an assistant minister, so you're still um, got semi-executive responsibilities. Um, and in the absence of that minister in parliament, your second role will be to answer questions that the parliament may have regarding your department. Um, and their powers? Well, their main power stems from party discipline, which is, of course, um, important for every minister. But the party discipline enables them to, if they have policies that they want to get through the parliament, if they have legislation they want to get through parliament, um, then party discipline will at least guarantee its passage through the lower house in ordinary circumstances. Um, secondly, they have access to information that people outside the government, backbenchers in their own party, and of course the opposition parties and the other minor parties in parliament do not have. Um, so that, uh, those are the assistant ministers. An example, there's 13 assistant ministers by the way, and Ben Morton's an example of that. He's the minister assisting the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, so um, you have an example to draw upon in your exam. Uh, next up the rung is non-Cabinet Ministers. So they've got departments of their own, but these departments are considered to be less important um, and um, their budgets tend to be smaller and decisions they might make are less sort of earth shattering. So they're not considered necessary to be in Cabinet. So um, they manage their own departments, that's their primary role. They also answer to Parliament like the Assistant Ministers would be. And then an th additional role is that upon request, um, they can attend the occasional Cabinet meeting if anything on the agenda affects their department. Um, and once again, their powers are essentially the same, party discipline and an information advantage over the non-government members of Parliament. Um, there are nine non-government, non-Cabinet Ministers uh, one such example is the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Richard Colbeck. Uh, this is a reminder that senators can be ministers too. It's not just members of the House of Reps, although by convention, I remind you, the Westminster Convention says there are two ministers that have to be from the House of Reps, and that is the Treasurer and the Prime Minister. Okay, let's take another step up. Now we have Cabinet Ministers. Cabinet ministers also manage their departments, and of course those departments are a lot larger, there's a lot more staff, and the decisions they make running that department are a lot more earth-shattering, meaning that they have to be regularly in cabinet. They will also be more regularly required to answer questions in parliament because their departments matter a lot more to the country. Um, so they have to perform well in question time, they attend these cabinet meetings, which are of course the, um, uh, the engine room of government, if you like, because in these meetings, you uh, contribute to the development of po government policy. So you throw ideas around and you debate them. And of course, you advocate for policies that you support. Secondly, political strategy, which is not the s exactly the same. Uh, political strategy is things like timing. When are we going to release this policy? And um, when are we going to release that policy? And um, how are we going to sell this particular policy that might not be popular and so on? So political strategy. Uh, building on that is um, talking about the overall narrative of government. Okay, what's your vision for the future? Um, 
and uh, what story are you going to build as the story of your government? Because you have to sell yourself at the next election. So that's an important aspect of cabinet meetings. Of course, cabinet meetings is a vital opportunity to exchange information between departments because the heads of each department are there. Um, so you want to make sure that you minimise over government. You don't want two departments doing the same thing. You want to be coordinating so that over government um, or doubling up is minimised. And finally, and possibly most importantly, is cabinet is the me main mechanism to which government responds to crisis events, whether that be a natural disaster, and of course there's horrible fires going on in New South Wales right now, um, and of course it can be economic crisis like the global financial crisis of 2008. So cabinet ministers have a lot to do, and of course their powers also are um, party discipline, an information advantage, um, and of course being able to be privy to cabinet meetings. Finally, on to the Prime Minister themselves. Okay, so yes, they too have a department to manage. Okay, the Prime, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, they also work most closely with the Governor General and one of the main jobs um, to do with the Governor General is to appoint the other ministers in your ministry. This is a huge role and it's also a huge source of the Prime Minister's power, being able to pick his or her team. Um, and finally, you're the public face of the government. So that narrative we talked about before, developing that narrative, the main storyteller is the Prime Minister because they get the most media attention, which we'll discuss um, later. Of course, the Prime Minister is currently Scott Morrison, and I should have mentioned there are 22 other cabinet ministers. Just a couple of examples, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg and Finance Minister Senator Matthias Gorman. Okay, moving on. On to powers and limits of the Prime Minister. Now, some of this you can obviously talk about all ministers, but given that there's been several questions on the Prime Minister themselves in recent times, um, having all of this stuff ready to go for your discussion is very helpful. Anyway, uh, party discipline, I hope for, I don't have to talk um, about that anymore, but block voting, uh, meaning what you want to get done, most likely will get done. A single person able to exert their will over an entire House of Parliament. Um, this is a huge source of the Prime Minister's power. Secondly, if information is power, and we have, we've talked about having an, an information advantage over your rivals, well, the person with the most information is the Prime Minister. Why? Well, essentially because each department of the government is required to feed information into the Prime Minister, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. For example, if a minister wants something on the agenda for the next cabinet meeting, they have to submit that request to Prime Minister and Cabinet. So the Prime Minister will always be aware of what's going on and what ministers are concerned about and what they want on the agenda. And this will give him an advantage going into each and every cabinet meeting. Um, uh, speaking of the cabinet meetings, um, if you get to pick your ministers, other ministers, then this becomes a really massive advantage in those cabinet meetings as well. Because um, as we already mentioned, there's 23 members of cabinet, 22 cabinet members plus the prime minister. So all you have to do is make sure at least 12 of those that you pick are supporters of you personally and supporters of your ideology. And you're gonna guarantee that you get your way most of the time in those cabinet meetings. Um, so sure, you will have rivals in your cabinet, but if as long as you make sure that they're in the minority, you will get your way most of the time. Um, massive, massive advantage for the Prime Minister. Um, additionally, the Prime Minister chairs the meetings, so they set the agenda, they decide what goes on the agenda and what gets discussed first, and what gets pushed to the back burner, and um, that's another way the Prime Minister can make sure they get their agenda prioritised over the agendas of perhaps other ministers and their and your rivals. Uh, fourthly, uh, sorry, thirdly, we have patronage. So this is, um, uh, as I've drawn here, the butt-kissing power. If you've got 
all of this power, the power to appoint ministers, the power to run the country, the power to decide budget priorities, then a lot of people want to kiss your butt, okay? And that's called patronage. People will patronize you. In other words, they will be willing to do favors for you and act in your interests if you have these powers. Um, so for instance, other members of parliament or other party apparatchiks might do you favors, might advocate for you, might do some fundraising for you, um, uh, when your back is turned and so on, um, in exchange for the hope, perhaps, of being promoted into the ministry in the future, or uh, at least not get demoted in the future by being a constant supporter. Outside of Parliament, we've got influential people like in the media and in business. Um, so you might, because um, having access to the Prime Minister would be such an advantage for a media uh, company or a particular journalist, maybe in exchange you'll be more likely to receive favorable coverage from the media, or all those media outlets. And, plus, and also in business, of course, money talks. Um, if businesses see that the Prime Minister has, um, uh, you know, power, as they do, they might be willing to do that Prime Minister favors um, in the form of perhaps donations to the political party or by just simply advocating for that prime minister in business circles, um, so that you know, advertising is at least anti-government advertising won't proliferate, as we saw with the uh, the anti-mining tax uh, advertising that um, started up once Rudd announced his idea for a super profits tax. Um, election day, it's a minor advantage, but still nevertheless an advantage. We have maximum term elections giving the Prime Minister a series of dates to choose from. Um, legislation requires it to be on a Saturday and within a certain range, um, but this range gives the Prime Minister a tactical advantage um, because in terms of preparing for the election day, only he will have an idea of what date he's thinking about. The opposition is just stuck with guessing when that might be. And so the Prime Minister can start preparing, getting into election mode before anyone else because only he or she knows when that will be. Um, also, you can pick the date to take advantage of perhaps um, a world event, a global event that happens, or to take advantage of the opposition that might be in disarray. Maybe they've had a leadership challenge or something like that, and you can call a snap election to take advantage of their poor organisation. Um, finally, media attention. Because the Prime Minister has the majority of the media attention, he can turn this into a power. Of course, it can be a poison chalice if you're a bad media performer, but media attention gives you advantages over your own backbenchers, your political rivals within your own party, and your political opponents in other parties. Okay, so backbenchers are disincentivized from criticizing you in the media because it hurts them as much as it hurts you as the Prime Minister, okay? Um, because most backbenchers are not really well known. Most voters don't vote for their particular backbencher because they are that person. They're voting for that backbencher because they are a member of the party that the voter is intending to vote for. And therefore, most people vote based on the leader, or they know who the leader of each party is, but they don't know who the local member is. Meaning, if backbenchers consistently criticize their own leader, this makes the leader look weak, this makes the party look disunited, this might put the voters off for voting for that party, and that's gonna hurt the backbenchers as much as it's gonna hurt the Prime Minister. So that's one advantage the Prime Minister has with all the media attention going to them. Um, secondly, rivals and opponents can have um, media, they can be starved of media attention. Um, if you think of it as a fire, um, you can be starved of oxygen, the fire goes out. Whereas, so if the Prime Minister has all the attention in the media, they can starve their rivals and opponents of telling their stories and convincing the people of Australia to vote for them instead. Um, and so probably the most classic example of this would be Trump in 2016. He said outrageous things at regular intervals. This meant that he hit the headlines consistently 
and all of his all of his rivals fell by the wayside because they weren't able to get their messages across to the American public. So it was brilliant strategy by Trump, if a little controversial, because he said some pretty crazy things, but it was a very effective strategy to get all the media attention. Okay, on to limits. Let's finish this off as quickly as we can. So, um, oops. So as for um, uh, limits to power, because when you ask to discuss things, you should definitely talk about the other side of the coin, which is things that can limit the Prime Minister's um, power. We've got obviously cabinet rivals or rivals within the party. These are, um, of course, we've got Rudd falling to Gillard, we've got Gillard falling to Rudd, we've got Abbott falling to Turnbull, and we've got Turnbull follow, falling to Dutton at first, but then, of course, Scott Morrison pr um, assumed the Prime Ministership. So all of these examples did not involve an election. So clearly, a huge limit to a Prime Minister's power is the threat of the rival within your own party. Um, now, as I said, you can use your advantage of picking your ministerial team to limit the power of the rival um, because you can, for, for starters, silence them because once you're in cabinet, you're required to be in solidarity with cabinet. I should have mentioned that in roles, by the way. A role of a cabinet minister is to um, observe cabinet solidarity, to publicly support the decisions of cabinet, even if you're not personally, in your heart of hearts, supporting of that. So Joyce, Joyce built a reputation of criticising his own team on a consistent basis if he didn't personally agree. So Abbott took the decision to make him a minister. So now he had to shut up and not criticise um, the coalition government and the policies that they were making. And if he wanted to remain a minister and get paid accordingly, he had to muzzle himself. Good strategy by Abbott. Um, a strategy that didn't work quite as well, same strategy but didn't work quite as well, was Gillard's decision to make Rudd foreign minister to keep him as happy as possible despite being losing the prime ministership. Um, he still harboured desires to get revenge and so it didn't work as well, but at least in the short term, Rudd had to publicly support um, his new Gillard government. Um, and of course, Dutton is the uh, shows you the other side of the coin. When Dutton wanted to challenge his prime minister, he had to first quit as Minister for Home Affairs, and once he did so, he was free from the shackles of cabinet solidarity and was able to start criticising Turnbull and the direction the Turnbull government was heading and offered alternative policies in the short time that he was no longer a minister. Um, next limit would be Parliament. Let's not forget Parliament. Even though party discipline has muzzled Parliament to an extent, we still have question time, which can be an effective um, hold of accountability for the ministers and for government. Don't forget a really good example here is Travelgate, where um, a couple of ministers lost their jobs after Simon Crean and the Labor Party were able to expose through question time um, inappropriate claim, travel claims by several ministers. Didn't affect the Prime Minister, although it hurt the Prime Minister with his team, didn't directly hurt the Prime Minister. Then we've got the Senate. Often the Prime Minister won't get their way because the Senate blocks it. So this is famous in the 2014 budget. Key budget measures were blocked by the Senate because the Prime Minister did not, well, his party did not have the control of the Senate. So the $7 GP co-payment is the easiest one to remember here. That was blocked by the Senate. Abbott wanted it, Abbott didn't get it. Um, and of course in estimates, um, you know, uh, poor spending, Decisions by the government can be exposed and can hurt the authority of the Prime Minister and perceptions can grow that you are not a good economic manager if consistently estimates is exposing poor spending. Um, then of course we've got the states, which still do live in a federation. States do have power and um, if the Prime Minister wants to get something that encroaches on areas of residual power, they can try. They can do, um, of course, the Section 96 payments they can try and get influence through the instrument of COAG. Um, but if the states are obstinate, like WA was, Colin Barnett was not keen on signing up to Rudd and Gillard's health funding partnership um, to, um, and the federal government wanted that because they wanted sort of 
um, key performance indicators, KPIs to match the funding. And Colin Barnett said, go jump in the lake, I'm not getting involved. So um, the federal government and the prime minister was unable to infl infiltrate the WA health system at that time. Of course, then we've got the governor general, a very small but significant potential limit to a prime minister's power. We've of course got the story of 1975 and we also have Cosgrove. Okay, I was very intrigued to read the letter when Cosgrove um, uh, accepted the Prime Minister's advice to issue writs for a May 19 election. There was a particular sentence in Cosgrove's letter that said, after I have received assurances that there is enough money to keep the government going in the caretaker period, because note May, the election was during May, which is a very awkward time to have an election because it's budget time. And since the budget had not been yet been passed before Parliament um, was dissolved, Cosgrove wanted an assurance before he said yes to the election that there was enough money in the bank. Once he got that assurance, then he said yes to the election. But it's a reminder. The sentence is a reminder that the GG could sometimes say no to a prime minister. Didn't happen this time, but it's a little shot across the bow. Number five is courts, of course. Courts can limit the authority of a prime minister by shutting down what they want to do, either through legislation or through executive actions. So a great example here is the Malaysia solution. Gillard's Malaysia solution was knocked on the head by the High Court. Um, and then a law, which was a law um, authorizing payments to the chaplaincy program in schools, government schools around the country, was knocked on the head in the High Court case of Williams number two. All right, um, I've gone as quickly as I can. Um, I hope that really helps you sort out in your head role and powers of the Prime Minister, Cabinet and the Ministry. And I wish you all the best.